Okay, so as the last people take the seat, um, we can warm up with the question. So the question is, phones out, and then you put them away again, of course, but phones out now. QR code, so we're doing the, the question, the last question of, not really the last question, but the last question before the panels. How often do you make cross-border payments? Weekly, monthly, a few times per year. <laughs> uh, Cross-border. Cross-border. So it can also be currency, of course. That we, it's open, open question. And open for interpretation. Yes, and open. It, no, cross whatever, however you define, we can define cross border what broad. We've defined it broad. Broad cross border. Yes. Yes. So the panel is mainly outside of Europe. So maybe you want to do outside of Europe. Cross border. Like, so not Europe to Europe. So not Germany to Belgium. That doesn't count. Yeah. So what do we have? A few times per year. Winning, a few times per year winning, followed by monthly, weekly, and then only a few of you, so 13 say year, never, yearly or never. So we have a lot now, it's growing for a few times per year. So that's not so much. Okay, so with this, we're gonna uh, go back to the last panel of the day, which is on cross-border payment. And I'd like to introduce Tara Rice from the BIS and she can introduce the panel. Thank you very much. Okay, Mike's working, great. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, so we're gonna go from uh, the domestic focus we've had today to uh, a, a cross-border international focus. And I'm very honored to be able to introduce our panel today. Um, we have on the end, Arish Binsal, the Director General of Market Infrastructure and Payments at, here at the ECB, and Maha L. Dimachki, Center Head of the BIS Innovation Hub in Singapore. Uh, to her left, we have Jose Luis Langa, Deputy Managing Director of EberPay. Next is Mehdi Mana, Chief Executive Officer of Buna. And then finally, Ritesh Shukla, Chief Executive Officer of NPCI, International Payments Limited. So we have a very international group here today. I'm delighted to be, um, be chairing this session. Let me just uh, uh, start with a few opening remarks. Um, uh, so we believe at the CPMI that interlinking of fast payment systems is one of the most promising solutions in the near term to help enhance cross-border payments. This is especially timely when we consider that we now have at least 75 fast payment systems in our operation around the world, and a further 24 have plans to establish links within the next five years. We've seen tremendous progress in domestic payment infrastructures over the years. Improving the safety and efficiency of domestic payment systems is also an investment in cross-border payments, since the first and last mile of a cross-border payment is typically processed in a domestic payment system. However, as we well know, cross-border payments are still lagging behind. Fully half of business-to-business -business payments take more than a day, and the global average cost for sending remittances in emerging markets and developing economies remains stubbornly high at over 6%. This disproportionately affects families in emerging markets and developing economies for which uh, international remittances are a primary source of income for many. So linking fast payment systems between different jurisdictions could help address cross-border payment challenges. The need for interme intermediaries in the cross-border payment value chain is reduced, leading to lower costs and greater transparencies. FPS, or fast payment systems, make 24-7 payments possible and linking them together could significantly increase the speed of a payment across borders. Technical and operational aspects to interlinking, while at time challenging, can be sorted out typically by operators willing to connect their fast payment systems. However, governance and oversight aspects are more difficult to solve and require involvement of authorities. Workable frameworks are essential to the establishment of safe and efficient fast payment system interlinking arrangements uh, across a large number of jurisdictions to support and maintain safe and efficient global uh, cross-border payments. For this reason, the G20 has identified the governance and oversight of cross-border payment system interlinking arrangements as a priority action to help achieve the goal 
of enhancing cross-border payments for all. The BIS Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructures, or the CPMI, which I represent today, is leading the development on this topic. So today's discussion gives us the opportunity to take advantage of our speakers' vast experience and to hear their views and plans on the potential of fast cross-border payments. We'll structure this in two rounds, as has been done. Um, we'll start with more general questions, for which you'll have about three minutes. Uh, and then we'll go into more detailed, a deep dive um, questions. So let me start now with Ulrich. Ulrich, uh, you're at the center of so many key developments in payments. You're the Director General for Market Infrastructure and Payments here at the ECB, a CPMI member, and you chair not only Eurosystem market contact groups, but also the CPMI's Industry Task Force on Cross-Border Payments, Interoperability, and Extension. Is that a mouthful? Tell us, Ulrich, <laughs> <laughs> what is your view on the role of interlinking for enhancing cross-border payments? Yeah. Okay, no, indeed, I mean, there are lots of uh, dimensions and as a central banker, as I learned, you know, in, in the payment space, you can act as a catalyst, you can act as an operator and as an overseer. And, and all those topics are relevant also for uh, interlinking. And I mean, to start with your question, why is uh, interlinking, I mean, you explained it already to quite some extent, why is interlinking has been prioritized? Why is it a good idea? I think there, there are a number of advantages. First, you recycle what uh, is, you know, a great achievement of the last years, which are the 24-7 instant payment systems, which we want to interlink. So by nature, the 24 hours operating time solves the overlap of operating hours problem, which we have in RTGS systems. So that's the first point. Second, you recycle everything you have at domestic level, you only need to interlink uh, what you have. So you have all the relationship, all the accounts, all the KYC, you can just interlink it and then you have basically a global uh, payment system. You keep the, competitive, uh, the competitiveness of uh, domestic payments, you keep um, the role of the regulated banking system, you avoid uh, fragmentation through, let's say, closed loop solutions, which can be successful, but if they're very successful also, they have market power, also problematic. So the beauty of, let's say, the, um, the commercial bank payment system, SEPA, what we have in uh, Europe, is uh, preserved by interlinking the systems. So then, of course, what, what is interlinking exactly? Um, so, yeah, if you zoom into it, what, what is it? It's not... Uh, it's not so trivial. I mean, interlinking, what, what are cross-border payments exactly? The secret to understand uh, what cross-border payments are is to see that they don't really exist now. You have always two domestic payments uh, on both uh, sides, on both currencies. You don't transform one currency into the other. So what does it mean, interlinking? And you know that it can mean various things. It can be more ambitious or less ambitious. What we have now, correspondent banking, is a sort of interlinking, but uh, it may be slow, it's not, it's not uh, instant, it may be expensive, and it's not uh, standardized, and it's not competitive. So, I mean, there are various steps you can now go towards the, let's say, holy grail of a perfect uh, interlinked system, starting with uh, a one-leg-out scheme, as we are working on uh, now in, uh, in Europe. Then you can, you know, do some technical interlinking which really ensures that the two legs, I mean, the two sides are really happening together, um, a sort of, you know, PVP in the payment. And you can, another technical thing you can then achieve is to keep the whole interlinked payment fast, you know, that really both happen at once and happen in the same uh, time horizons that your domestic uh, payment should happen. And you can also, of course, work on the user interface um, that you have, uh, you know, from the user, the whole chain can be efficiently organized or not. Um, and last but not least, uh, the ultimate, let's say, browning is probably to have a competitive FX conversion at the middle instead of the con FX conversion in a less transparent and uh, competitive way by the respective account providers, yeah? So there are lots of different things you can uh, do and you have to work on. 
and the reality and and I think the colleagues sitting here all, all know because they, they are working on it the reality is uh, is uh, yeah a lot of work a lot of detail even though the idea in principle I think is very compelling and has rightly been identified as a key priority Thanks, Ulrich. I, that really helps set the stage because we're going to hear now from some uh, some use, real use, real live use cases. Um, so I'm going to turn to Mehdi Ritesh and Jose Luis. Um, as we noted, that domestic uh, fast payment system adoption can be seen as a precondition to leverage fast payment potential for cross border payments. Can you please share with us what you see as the main challenges and successes uh, for domestic fast payment system adoption? And could you share with us what is the impact on financial inclusion and promising use cases going forward? So let me start with Mehdi. Thank you, Tara. Maybe uh, start with a slightly different view. So that uh, the real prerequisite is the adoption of a uh, fast payment system. More certain characteristic of fast payment system. Uh, why am I saying that? Because the current existing solutions for uh, payment national level are fast enough in most of the IGS system that exists at regional or national level, they settle in a few seconds. The issue is more the difficulty of interconnecting them. So the current existing RTG system are very difficult to interlink. This is what we are trying to overcome with the instant payment that are being developed now, because they have certain characteristics that would help in that direction. One of them was mentioned by Ulrich is the 24 by 7. Uh, a key second fundamental characteristic that would uh, facilitate the interlinking is the adoption of common standard, in particular for messaging. Uh, so most of these inter, uh, fast payment solutions are relying on ISO 2022, and, and that facilitates a lot of the interlinking between different systems. A third aspect that is making the interlinking today between RTGS systems difficult is more the legal arrangement or the LGBT criteria to this system. Uh, so that could remain equally complex and positive with the, with the FBS adoption. Uh, is it better now? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> shall, shall I repeat? No. <laughs> Okay, uh, that could re remain equally complex uh, with the adoption of APA, FPS. So this is something that we have to to bear in mind when uh, promoting the interconnection or the interlinking of uh, APS solution that we make them open from all perspective in terms of uh, uh, operating hours, in terms of uh, standard adoption, uh, in terms of uh, legal setup and, and LGBT criteria. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in our case in Buna, we have the two components. So we have an RTGS service, and we have the instant payment services. But we are promoting both for the interlinking, because the way we designed the RTGS, we paid attention to these fundamental uh, uh, factors that would facilitate the interlinking. So our RTGS system is also open, not yet six, seven days a week, but six days a week. Uh, the operating hours are rather extensive ones, so they go beyond the different RTGSs of the currency that we have uh, uh, in Buna. Uh, in terms of standard, we are already 2022 compatible. And in terms of eligibility criteria and legal setup, we make it as flexible as possible to be able to interconnect easily with, with others. So from our perspective, whether we interlink our RTGS or IPS system, the way we call it, it's equally beneficial and it's equally easy. It's more about the readiness of the other party to make a choice between one of uh, these two options. Uh, you asked the question on financial inclusion. It's a, it's a crucial one. Uh, what, uh, what, what could be the contribution of a uh, uh, fast payment system to financial inclusion? Uh, so here again, I'm not sure that the key word is about uh, fast, it's about the speed. It is true that uh, many of the first payment solutions have uh, contributed to increase the financial inclusion in many countries. But in most of these cases, it's because of they, they were open to non-banks, to, 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 to say the, the, the truth. Uh, it's making the same system faster uh, does not make it easier to access from those who are currently excluded today. So we need new operators that have different perspectives and that are willing to uh, offer uh, certain services, not full banking services, but certain services to the unbanked people now. Thank you, Mehdi. 
Uh, and you raise a number of very solid challenges. Um, some of these we're trying to overcome through the CPMI's work, of course. And for those of you that may not know it, um, the CPMI released uh, ISO 20022 harmonization requirements last year. And we're in the process now of trying to set, set up a, a little bit more governance around it and, and spread the word. So if you know it, spread the word. <laughs> okay, let me turn next to then Ritesh. Um, so please tell me the main challenges and success factors for domestic payment adoption and impact on financial inclusion from your perspective, please. Thank you uh, for the question. Uh, if you look at uh, the payment platform that we operate in India, it's called Unified Payment Interface. And uh, as per a report, uh, in India, we process about 46% of instant payments that happen globally. Now, there are five things that I think stand out for us. And these are built on the challenges that we face. And these are you know, things that I personally feel that are very important to, to make a fast payment platform successful. I think the first one is aligning with the, the, the national or the, the, the policy agenda. What are you trying to achieve? So in India, for us, cash displacement, financial inclusion, uh, super important, super relevant. Uh, we are a big country in terms of population and area as well. So I think finding out that common purpose with the government, uh, you know, goals and national agenda is is, 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 is key. The second is, uh, you know, making it simple. Uh, there are times that people design apps or design interfaces that only they and their employees can use. So trying to keep it simple, uh, trying to, you know, standard, try to standardize uh, op build interoperability. In India, we today operate uh, the, the UPI uh, interface, the whole ecosystem with complete interoperability. So you may be a merchant acquired by Google Pay, but your phone pay will, app will uh, work 100% all the time, every time. Similarly, on the cases of banks. So build interoperability, standardize it as much as you can. And we are also running our uh, P2P using aliases and our P2M using QR codes. So these are very easy, intuitive ways to understand. I think a lot of people in earlier panel were talking about the older population. I think in, in India, you know, the older population has equally embraced digital payments as the younger ones. And I'll be happy to host a delegation from here to come and see it for, for themselves. So, so simplicity. The third is democratization. We have to design for everyone. Uh, we have to design for people who use feature phones. We have to design for people who use smartphones. We have to design for young, uh, you know, old. We have to design for rural, urban, rich, poor, everyone. So that's the whole, uh, that's one of the underlying principle that we kind of apply to, to car, whatever we do at NPCI. And fourth is uh, futuristic. So we are continuously adding newer use cases on our platform. And the idea is to continuously displace cash. We are using new use cases. We are using, uh, uh, new experiences. So, for example, recently uh, we have now launched uh, uh, something called credit on UPI. So, imagine a small business owner uh, looking to obtain credit from financial institutions. Now, they can apply for those business loans using UPI and that loan that gets sanctioned comes and sits as a funding source on UPI app and the business owner can then go on spending about it, meeting his or her business expenses. So, very futuristic. We are uh, we have been enabling open banking since 2016. You can use any UPI app and connect it to any funding source, savings account, checking account, current account, overdraft, credit card, uh, and, and offline wallet, a prepaid wallet. And now we are doing a CBDC pilot in India. Once central bank approves, you can also connect your CBDC to a UPI powered app. So, so, so that's futuristic. And I think the fifth and the most important to me is the power of ecosystem. You know, the ecosystem has banks, fintechs, regulators. How do you bring everyone together? And uh, you know some of the biggest players, like Mandy was saying, for us uh, are fintechs. You know, fintechs go where banks don't go because banks are driven by profitability. Banks are driven by you know various uh, you know things. But fintechs are agile, they are fast, and they have beautiful consumer experiences. For us, in our case, you know, Google Pay. How many times do you use Google on a daily basis? Now imagine an app from Google. You know, it's very close to consumer. Similarly, WhatsApp. WhatsApp is integrated with UPI in India. I can use the same chat box to send you money the way I interact with you. So it's non-intrusive. So I think these are like things that really stand out for us. And all this has come by way of our learning. And uh, last year, we did about 117 billion transactions on UPI, close to $2.2 trillion worth of commerce. And now our current run rate is between 13 to 14 billion transactions a month. So that's the scale we have achieved and all uh, by being agile and you know improvising uh, on the challenges that we face. I think it's really uh, incredible what India has accomplished over the past several years. Uh, let me turn now to Ho Jose Luis. Um, and let me just say, but while we were um, preparing for the panel, we, we talked about the previous panel on financial literacy. And 
some of us have 12 year old sons and we were talking about the fact that it is actually difficult to teach your children financial literacy when they can't even get a debit card or a credit card. <laughs> I tried for my son, it became a conquest to see if I could get him uh, just a debit card so I could teach him financial literacy. And Ho Jose Luis has a story for us, evidently. Yeah, but at, at the end of my intervention, I, I will start. Yes. <laughs> I promise and I fulfill my promise. I just wanted to preface that. Uh, okay, let me start by, by thanking uh, you for inviting, inviting me to come to this place. It's very special for me. 25 years ago, I was here working at the ECB, only Holga, Ido, um, and uh, Paco and Nacho, who has left, uh, they are not uh, friends anymore. Um, and, and since then, a lot of things has been done. And, but I, I agree with you, Ray. Faster payment is the most exciting thing that we have done in payments. That is clear for me. That has changed the world. That has changed the payment. That has touched uh, the people, the corporates. And, and we are at the starting phase of this. So I go with your questions, challenges. When we start with uh, instant payments, and I'm not saying faster payments, for me it's instant, and you, you will see why. Uh, the, the first challenge is to create a network. It's, uh, in payments, if you, don't, you cannot reach any person, any bank, you are lost. So that, that, has, that was the first challenge, and we, uh, made uh, this challenge happen in, in Spain because uh, every bank was uh, trying to, to get engaged, uh, mainly because of BISUM here on the front line. And, uh, and we engaged uh, 70, 80, 95 percent of the, of the traffic in, uh, of the banks in Spain and their bank accounts. So that was pretty easy at the domestic level. But we wanted to go a little bit further. And it is, uh, we are not uh, Spanish, we are Europeans, we are in, within the SEPA area. From the very first day, we had the connection happen to RT1. And when TIPS uh, was launched, we had the, the first connection to TIPS and the first transaction with TIPS. And now, the immediate uh, step is, okay, Spain, SEPA, it's the world. And this is what we are aiming, is creating the network, but a worldwide and network. And, and to this end, we need to have all the banks, all the fintechs, central banks, by the way, to be there. And, and that is a, and that is a, a challenge that, the, that we need to, to have. That is the first challenge. The second is technical. We need to be 24 by 7, uh, 365. And that uh, requires a lot of uh, resources and you need to make uh, any technical changes, you must do it, but you, you, you have to fulfill uh, all, all your tasks because there are thousands of transactions coming at any time of the day, any time of the week. So that is a challenge. And performance. Uh, I, I'm not uh, so, so much in agreement with Medi this time. Uh, we could be very fast. We process end-to-end transactions in 600 milliseconds, below that, within Spain. We have worked hard. Uh, this, uh, this Monday, I had a, a, a meeting with the ECB people asking what are the uh, recipe, uh, the secret recipe for this. I cannot tell you, but uh, <laughs> a, a lot of work on the, on the backstage. Uh, and this is what we have done. And what is important is for the third challenge, we need to use uh, instant payments for all kind of use cases, peer to peer. Yeah, it's a, it is not a big deal. It's a, if I'm making you a payment, it doesn't matter if it is a question of seconds or, or a minutes, provided you pay me, it's fine. In e-commerce, it is becoming a, a little bit more challenging. On the brick and mortar and the physical commerce, we need the speed. So we, we are aiming for that. And use cases, we are also aiming to create use cases together with a separate request to pay, and of course, one leg out, the uh, connecting uh, the world. That, that are the challenges, together with one difficult problem that we are facing, and it is uh, the flip side of instant payments, and it's instant fraud. Mm -hmm. and we are addressing this. We have uh, at Everpay up to six tools to prevent, recuperate, 
exchange information, we have plenty of tools to keep a fraud under control. Probably we will never beat fraud, but we, we will be able to keep it uh, under control. And there is plenty of collaboration that, that, that could be done on this, uh, on this side, because it's a win-win. The more we collaborate, the, the, the difficult uh, tasks that, that the fraudsters may have. These are the challenges. The success uh, factor is, of course, overcome the challenges. And in Spain, it's clearly it's vision. It's, uh, we, how can you make transactions easily if you need to re, uh, remind the rechtliche Ivan, Ivan the, the terrible Ivan, 24 digits? You, you, you never succeed with this. You need uh, value added services on top that could use proxies and whatever, and put rules and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and go to the business case. This is a, a done deal in Spain with Bism, and this is the success factor. And then I go to the, to the inclusion. When, when immigrants came to Spain, they immediately noticed that they need a current account because immediately for, uh, for all utilities, for a mobile, they, they, um, in Spain, there is only direct debit. It's a direct debit country like Germany. And, and if you want anything, uh, the provider is, is telling you, give me your current account. And immigrants that didn't use uh, accounts in, in their countries of origin came to Spain and they need a, a current account. And of course, once they have it, they need a debit card to use in the, on, the, uh, on the ATMs. But now, in the, since uh, Bizum is there, it is, it is uh, one of the must. If you don't have Bizum, you are socially excluded, not financially excluded. It's, you are socially excluded. Hmm. You cannot pay than be paid. So that's, uh, that is uh, um, one of the reasons that, uh, that it's helping or catalyzing, the, uh, catalyzing the, the financial exclusion. And my story with my, with my kids, my kids, needs desperately to have vision to receive money from their grandparents, uh, from the uncles uh, and everyone. I tried, and, and, and of course the Spanish banks are eager to provide uh, accounts to younger people uh, because uh, they, they need vision and they provide them with a debit card. And what they don't know, my kids, is that any transaction that comes to their accounts, uh, I have a, a message on my phone and say, <laughs> okay. That's the end of the story. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now let me turn to Maha. Maha, um, okay, let's talk about some multilateral solutions. Can you please tell us about um, BIS Innovation Hub Project Nexus? Um, um, yes, tell us all about it, the benefits, the disadvantages, and where you are with it now. Thank you. I'll start by saying it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and actually, I don't know how much else I can say listening to the contributions of everybody. Um, you know, talking about the uh, the benefits of uh, and singing the praises of faster payments, that's been the basis of Nexus is really taking this very successful infrastructure and looking, you know, what can you do with it from the point of view of linking um, faster payments cross border and all the points actually that um, Ulrich just made that um, I, I won't necessarily uh, repeat. So the the, the uh, inspiration for us was. Um, the success of instant payments, but also some of the attempts in the region to uh, to look at bilateral links that have been successful and have been um, set up. And so in, in Asia, there's been bilateral links. And in fact, there's a lot of conversations outside of Asia for, you know, setting up bilateral links um, for, uh, you know, instant payments on a cross-border basis. But very soon we realised um, in the region that you could do one or two. They take about two years to implement start to finish. Um, and there's constant maintenance, constant kind of management uh, of these. You may be able to do one or two, but then when you start to, do, to want to do more than that, and the ambition is always that it's, you know, looking at your trading corridors and remittance um, corridors and so on, um, and it, it's, it's more than just, often it's more than just two countries. It becomes unwieldy, it becomes very difficult and costly to do that. And so uh, the BIS Innovation Hub then uh, came together with a group of uh, central banks to think about you know, why can't we test linking um, on a multilateral basis where you, know, you create a hub and the instant payment system links in once and everybody that links into that hub is automatically, you know, uh, connected. So that was the idea. Um, 
and and it was tested and it, and technology works technology always works that's kind of the the, the easy part really um, but we needed to ensure that when we're looking at this um, you know what what will make it desirable for for, for uh, partners for countries to want to join and so Again, all of the points that were made, I think Mehdi made the points on um, the uh, legal structure and, and, and some of the you know, divergence there and compliance and, um, and, and so on. So we had to really think about what are the principles that we needed to um, hold ourselves uh, to, to account as we develop uh, uh, Nexus to ensure that it continues to meet the, the, the objectives of what it's meant to achieve. So public policy objectives, for example. We looked at inclusivity, neutrality, scalability, agility, um, and it had to be financially sustainable. So we, throughout all of the development that we've done from a proof of concept to where we are now, um, you know, we held ourselves to account against those principles. And, and we, we pivoted every time we felt that we were going down the wrong path. So for example, um, you know, we looked at whether we do this in a, in a single hub or whether we should, uh, we should look at multiple hubs. Um, we started off with single and we thought, you know, this is, this is the way to go. But then we realized that when we look at public policy objectives, um, you know, resilience and, um, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, backup when things go wrong um, and com competition won't necessarily be achieved. So we then, you know, moved away from that single hub to say, let's look at regional hubs. And the regional hubs will inject that resilience, um, a bit of uh, you know disaster recovery, competition in in, in the system, um, and and in terms of the use cases, that I mean that's another uh, another point that was raised. Again, we looked at you know what are the multiple use cases that we could do, and there, there are multiples. You know, faster payment system and instant payment systems can, to um, Jose Luis's point, do, do a lot, right? But you have to start somewhere. And what was important to us is the points on financial inclusion, the remittance payments for migrant workers, it was important in the region, and it's important for all of the, the various remittance corridors that are out there. So that's our first use case. But it's important to also um, highlight that you have to start somewhere, and then you start to build on it from there. So I think I'll stop there in the interest of time, because I don't want to be Thanks very much. Hold off by Tara. <laughs> Thanks very much, Maha. Uh, well, we are running a little bit short on time, so we'll have to increase our transaction speed. Um, but let's go to the second round, and this time I'm going to start backwards. I'm going to um, I'm going to start with you again, Maha, um, and I'd like you to please um, share with us the other BIS Innovation Hub projects that can support the rollout of Nexus. Well, so um, you know, we thought of Nexus as the starting point. I think um, maybe if if I can uh, follow up slightly on where we are with Nexus. Um, and then I could talk a little bit about the other projects. So we're at phase three. Um, a report will come out in the next couple of months. And uh, to, to all of the points made already, phase three looked at three key work streams. Um, we, we've done a prototype. Actually, the Eurosystems were part of the prototype. It was uh, Eurosystems Singapore and Malaysia. And as I said, technology works. Um, but, it was, but we needed to go to production grade. So we needed to make sure that we built a blueprint that if it were to be implemented in the real world, it can actually work. And so we looked at um, technology and operations, which, um, uh, you know, the architecture that we needed to, to build uh, is, you know, scalable. Um, it can take a large number of transactions, but not only that, it can also cater for the legal requirements in every country. The architecture has to, you know, observe the, the, the data rights, for example, and data laws of every country and the various compliance rules of every country. So that was really important in terms of technology and operations. Um, scheme and governance was really important. What is this, the prevailing scheme? What we wanted to do is use what's already there that is familiar to everybody. So again, our scheme and governance, uh, based on, you know, um, uh, use cases that are out there and based on compliance processes and um, and scheme rules that are already uh, out there. And the final uh, is um, business and commercial, which is the financial sustainability. This is a business model that works for all the participants, but also achieves the G20 targets of keeping transaction costs low, below 3% um, uh, uh, is, is what we've targeted. So we've done all of that work um, with the ASEAN five countries. But we also want to make sure that we are taking it global. So wherever it starts, we're at the point now where we're looking at how we take it into implementation. 
we're not implementing necessarily or running or operating at, at the BIS, but we will support um, those who want to take it to implementation. And it's a global structure. So we want to, we, we've got a, a roadmap of um, expanding globally, um, scalability on a, on, a, on a global level, because that's where you get the benefits. Um, product roadmap is really important. And the point that, um, in a very long-winded way, I'm going to get to your, your answer, um, enhancements of you know, what it does. We relied on what exists today. We tried not to create anything new. But there's still compliance issues that happen that would need to be dealt with in um, cross-border payments today. It's a pain for everybody, and we all know that they're slow and they take time and so on. Um, there's, uh, you know, issues around, um, I think, uh, which you mentioned that as well, uh, issues around clearing and settlement of foreign exchange. We're not tackling that with the first phase of Nexus, but we are with other projects um, where, you know, one of our projects, Mandela, is looking at uh, a compliance layer where you can automate your compliance checks and you can calculate them uh, or you, you can you can you know generate a, a proof that you've done your compliance and that travels with the transaction cross border so it's a big enough topic that it requires a project in and of itself um, but if successful it could potentially be implemented to nexus to enhance it but also to other you know other structures out there that need this because it's you know it needs to be agile and it needs to be interoperable and so on um, and then on the clearing and settlement, I mean, it's it's a tough it's a tough question, and you know it hasn't been solved, and we're, a lot of people are thinking about it. So we're also looking at the use of CBDCs, um, and whether there are ways in which we can uh, enhance, um, you know, the, the clearing and settlement as it's uh, relative to what it's done today. And and there's there's we've done it we've done it with Project Mariana, but there's uh, there's other projects that we have in the pipeline that we're that we're thinking about. So. I'll thank, stop there. Thank you, Maha. Um, back to Auric. So Auric, um, I'm going to uh, speed up a little bit. So since last February, tips can be used to settle instant payments between the euro and the Swedish krona. Can you tell us where you're going with, um, with tips? Uh, there's also the project with Albania. Uh, why not offer cross-currency services on the tips platform? Tell us a little bit about the vision. Uh, yeah. Indeed, TIPS was launched 2018, and uh, Jose Luis will say that was not so early, but we were still proud of it, and because it's settlement directly in central bank money, that was a bit the, the innovation, and uh, I think technically it, it worked uh, very well. Volumes have been uh, picking up now, and the latest development indeed was the uh, migration of all Swedish instant payments to uh, TIPS uh, in Swedish krona. So TIPS was designed as multi-currency uh, capable from the beginning and, and Sweden was now the first um, currency or country uh, joining that and the migration worked uh, very fine. So now we have um, all the volumes of the Swedish market on tips. The volumes are higher than the euro market. That's, uh, that's <laughs> astonishing but maybe not astonishing because Sweden is such an advanced uh, country in terms of having done this migration of, um, of uh, P2P and even uh, POI payments to uh, instant. And, and so we are, of course, very happy that this country, which is so advanced, had the trust also and, uh, and joined TIPS and everything uh, worked perfectly uh, fine. And there's also uh, Denmark in the pipeline. So Denmark will uh, join um, in uh, next year, in one year time. And also uh, Norway has uh, expressed interest and um, may, may decide uh, to join as well. And uh, so we don't have yet cross-currency uh, uh, payment, but uh, of course the, the business case for it, if you have several countries uh, in the EU on TIPS is, uh, is quite obvious. Now you have uh, less uh, regulatory issues, legal issues to solve if they are all in the EU or EA and you have uh, the same technical platform, so the technical interoperability is easier, and because of the common market also, you have, uh, you have a business case, you have uh, um, you know, common uh, commerce and so on that, that can be uh, paid then. So all the preconditions are there, and uh, there's a lot of commitment. Well, we, we must admit again a learning experience that uh, we had a press release in 2000 when uh, we had the visit of the Swedish um, governor and uh, together with our president declared in this press release 
that we will work on this cross currency. Now we are four years later, and uh, yeah, we are still working on it. And I think it will come. But okay, it, I mean, it's not so trivial as uh, as all of us know. And we first had to get, uh, or the priority was to get Swedish krona on tips. Now we can uh, uh, turn f I mean, to the to the interlinking, and. Of course, Denmark is also very interested in the interlinking. So now it's a common uh, project of the three. So in a certain way, we also have a multilateral uh, setting uh, there. So we will work on this and we hope to implement that, let's say, in the next two years yeah, to really um, have this. So we are there we are focused on Europe. You mentioned uh, Albania and, uh, and others of the uh, Western Balkan uh, six. I mean, there the setup is a bit different that um, the, I mean, it's not, they will not take tips, but a clone of tips, and it will not be, you know, fully integrated into the Euro system um, governance, but it's more a project of Banca d'Italia, really, who will clone tips uh, for those um, uh, countries and currencies. And I would say that that makes a lot of sense. The, the long-term perspective of those countries is to also join the EU, the euro area. So if they are moving now to instant payments, um, then that, that makes sense from this long-term perspective. And TIPS is now a well-tested system. And of course, you have economies of scale to clone it, to redeploy it. So it's, uh, it's quite a success uh, there. But let me also say, this is now all very European, but we are also keen, you know, to follow up on the G20 global agenda and to interlink uh, TIPS uh, globally. And I, I would like to interlink with everybody sitting here because uh, those are, all, yeah, so, <laughs> no, definitely. I mean, but, but then as you said, Maha, it's a matter of resources. No, if you do um, every of those, if you do them one by one is uh, resource intensive and you need to have the resources um, and uh, yeah, you want to do it clearly, you committed, we almost committed to it now in the G20 work. So now we want to do it, but we have to organize it and uh, focus it that we really progress and, and not just talk about it, but definitely we want this uh, global dimension as well. Thank you, Ulrich. Uh, let me turn now to Mehdi, uh, staying with the idea of, of currencies and, and links. Um, can you just share what challenges you face when you onboard new currencies? And what other links do you plan to establish within and outside the Arab region? Yeah, so for those who do not know it, we, uh, we are already a multi-currency system now. So we have uh, four uh, Arab currency plus uh, the euro and the dollar. Uh, I always thought that uh, designing uh, from scratch a multi-currency solution is much easier than making uh, a solution that was initially mono-currency becoming multi-currency. Multi so this is how we, uh, we, we have implemented things. So Bonal is a multi-currency system since its inception uh, and from all perspective. Uh, so starting by the technical uh, layer, uh, for us now it's very easy to onboard additional currency. So uh, the six that I mentioned, it took us between two to three months to onboard new currency from a technical perspective. The, the, the settlement mechanism is the same. It's multi-currency by design. What we need to invest on, it's just the, the interface with, with the specific currency, which is not very costly, not very time consuming. Uh, in terms of governance as well, we have designed our governance to be open to multi-currency. So uh, our uh, uh, oversight framework uh, cater for including any central bank that agree on including its currency in, in, in Buna. Uh, so in terms of oversight and in terms of governance, uh, as well, the system is designed in order to welcome very easily new currency. Uh, the last uh, point that is very critical in this context, and it has been mentioned by, by a few of my colleagues in the panel, uh, is the compliance. Uh, so our compliance framework as well, we implement it in a way that is multi-currency by design. Uh, we have uh, the, the, the luxury of being a supranational organization, so we are not bound to any specific legislation. And therefore, we can uh, set up our own rules and our own standard uh, ourselves. Uh, so we, we, we implemented a compliance framework that can cater of, uh, the, for the needs of the different regulators uh, for the, of the currency that we onboard. 
uh, and with which we can set uh, the rules and the expectation to all our participants the way we wish. Uh, and this is what makes including new currencies or new participants very easy to implement because the framework is very flexible and uh, able to, uh, to adapt to the different uh, situations. Um, when it comes to the interlinking, we try to uh, follow the same philosophy. So we try to avoid that uh, any new initiative of interlinking with uh, some of our partners uh, becomes a huge project in its own. Uh, so we, we, we try to implement a framework of our interlinking, which is largely based on uh, uh, the leg out scheme. Uh, as mentioned by Jose Luis and, uh, and Ulrich. Uh, and there are different reasons for that, not only because uh, it's a very powerful scheme, uh, but because we want to create opportunities for our participant. Uh, we, we had the dilemma at a certain point in time, whether we want to con control the SLA end to end between us uh, and the, the partnering uh, system, uh, with with uh, also an involvement from from the two uh, uh, system operator uh, in, in a in more stronger way, or whether we 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 make it dependent on our participant, uh, which which create a kind of complication because what is the incentive for the participant? How to bring them up to speed to to collaborate and uh, uh, support the interlinking between the two systems? But on the other hand, we create opportunities for them create opportunities because there is business. Uh, so uh, if, if a bank is, uh, let's assume, participating in TIPS and in BUNA, uh, that bank will be able to serve the two communities by offering this interlinking arrangement between the two platforms. Uh, so we keep it flexible uh, and we have different approaches even, even on the top of that flexibility. So sometimes you leave it to the banks to, to see the business case, to, to make an offer by themselves. Uh, in other cases, for uh, the corridor that we consider uh, critical, for example, with uh, with India, with uh, also with TIPS, we do one further step. So we engage in the discussion with NPCI, with uh, with the ECB, uh, to make sure that the tools exist from the two sides to make this possible. So we have made sure that the scheme that we are implementing now, so we have already our leg like, out scheme uh, uh, in operation in Buna. We made sure through a detailed assessment with our colleagues from NBCI, with uh, also the TIP team, that these schemes are open and compatible and will allow banks from India to possibly onboard to Buna and serve the two communities, or from Europe to also onboard to Buna and act as a bridge between the two systems. That's thinking into the future. Um, thank you very much. So turning to Ritesh, um, so NPCI, well, India more generally, is pursuing bilateral links with a number of other uh, fast payment systems. Can you tell me about uh, India's vision on, on bilateral versus, say, multilateral links, such as connecting to a hub or establishing a common platform? So I think before I answer that, I just wanted to highlight the contours of the market that we are trying to address. So we have 30 million Indians who live outside India. It's probably as big as population of Malaysia, Australia, or Saudi Arabia. Put separately. And these, uh, this diaspora sends about 125 billion every year to India. And at the same time, our outward remittances are also increasing. So I think uh, I, the last number I think I remember is about 20 to 25 billion. And they have grown four times in the last five years, if you see outward remittances. And primarily because now more and more Indian students are studying outside. I think there are about 350,000 students in the United States and the number is increasing. So we are a big market and there is a identified need uh, to kind of serve inbound as well as outbound. Now, given the scale uh, that we have, I think we are pursuing both. Uh, you know, we are, we are, as Mahdi said, we are engaged with Buna. We are also, you know, uh, participating in Nexus uh, discussions. So uh, we are looking at both, but also look at, you know, there are about 200 countries in the world. It's very difficult to maintain bilateral with every country. But there are certain countries which are big in, in, in the kind of flows with India. So, for example, countries in GCC or North America, US, Canada in particular, Europe. So those are the markets wherein, you know, it, it would you know make sense to have bilaterals as well. But at the same time, having both rails would also help because it makes, uh, you know, a system more resilient and, and uh, you know, creates options for consumers. So uh, we are looking at both the options. And at the same time, the overarching approach that we have is that we have like we've divided the whole strategy into two phases. The phase one is more focused on infrastructure build. So I think by 2030, we are looking at, you know, creating these connections. 
and thereafter will come the time wherein you need to kind of build and scale and and, and you know make uh, better user experiences and, and that would be phase two but having said that even the bilaterals that we are building we are today live with singapore so if you're living in india you want to send money to singapore or if you're living in singapore you want to send money to india it takes about 15 to 20 seconds for the end-to-end -end transaction to happen and this includes a uh, uh, compliance and various compliance requirements and at the same time so there are two legs one is the validation leg which in, uh, takes care of the compliance and other requirements and then there is financial leg which ensures that credit happens to bank account so that is life uh, with limited uh, set of banks in singapore and india and we are now looking at scaling up to include more banks uh, we are going to go live with another country by end of june which is again very very important for us uh, given the current flows and I think another big country by end of this year. So we will probably end of this year, we'll have three live collections and we are in discussion with many uh, players for bilateral as well as for multilateral connections, including, like I said, with Nexus and Buna. Super, thank you. Thank you for that. And let me turn now to Jose Luis. Uh, so you co-lead the task team looking into cross-border fast payments as part of uh, the task force on um, cross-border payments interoperability and extension. Um, could you tell me what you think the industry can do to support this priority action of interlinking of instant payments or fast payment systems? Sure. First, uh, I would start by our vision. Our vision is that is um, cross-border payments could be a use case of instant payments. Another one. Instant payments have the power to make uh, cross-border payments better, faster, easier, I can repeat what uh, you said at the beginning, uh, less intermediaries are, are, are needed, the cost is lower. The cost of instant payment is much lower than the typical RTGS system, much lower. Greater transparency, um, the speed, we don't have cut off times and the, and the overlapping moments of a, of a system in New Zealand and, and Uberpay is 24 by seven. No, no more cutoffs, no more weekends, no more bank holidays. That is, uh, helps a lot as a catalyst for financial inclusion. The, the resources that you need to, uh, to spend are very limited, but because you are reusing an infrastructure that you are using already, you can put a, a lot of uh, value added services on top, and it is, uh, the, you, you have the real, reliability and trust of the banks. It's the banks, it's account to account payments. So that is why. We believe that this is not uh, the most promising solution. Probably it's the only solution that we can envisage. Probably it's, it's a CDBC, it's cross-border. Yeah, could, could create a very difficult product uh, to solve that. Of course, this is easily said and done. And in this group, uh, we have uh, discussed a lot about what is missing, what, is, what are the problems. And if uh, Ulrich allow, allows me, because it's uh, for tomorrow's meeting, I can anticipate a little bit what we have, uh, our, the, the insights. And, and, and what we have, done, we have seen is first, it's obvious. We don't have instant payments everywhere. You said 75, maybe 20 more on the pipeline. But my, my feeling is that it is a universal right uh, to have instant payments. If you have an account, why not you have the right to move it instantly 24 by 7 it's a universal right probably it's a it's an it's an ambition that it goes well beyond now of this uh, of this meeting but but instant payments should be everywhere banks central banks fintechs should be allowed or should be should participate in instant payment that is clear for me it's a, you have to build the reach, including fintechs, including central banks, including all banks. That is that is clear, um, and and on equal footing, fintechs or banks can uh, settle their own transactions. Fintechs should do it as, as well. But at the same time, faster or instant payments should include or should uh, accept uh, international payments. The one leg out that we have uh, created in. In Europe, uh, many years after we started with SEPA, should be a must for each system. It is a simply, simply another use case for instant payments. And why not accepting uh, cross-border payments? It's, it is another use case. 
Of course, we have the, the question of standards and 2022 seems to be the magic word of, of uh, uh, same standards, but uh, it, is, uh, it is a tricky issue because it's a subset of, of standards and, and a lot of uh, work has to be done. Another issue that we have discovered is reciprocity. It's not, uh, it is not enough to receive payments. No, no, you, you need to receive and to, and to send a cross-border payment. That is another issue. It uh, also, the, um, the, the instant payment should be capable of uh, catering all uh, use cases. And all use cases means B2B payments. We have limits on, on our instant payments in Europe, 100,000. Okay, that's fine for my kids, more than enough. But if, if, it, if we are talking about business, maybe it's not enough. Why not cross-border pay or this use case should uh, avoid uh, this, uh, this kind of limits? Why we don't uh, are working with, uh, with worker, worker remittances companies that are providing cash at the first or the last leg or wallets or fintechs uh, or cards processors? So that's uh, the kind of things that uh, we can further work. And of course, all, all the issues about compliance and anti-money laundering, fraud, and, then, and FX and on, a, on, a, on an instant world. Uh, that is plenty of work, but uh, let me finish by, by this in, uh, in the interest of time. For me, we have done a lot with the instant payments. And I'm proud that, uh, that, uh, that we have a purpose. We, we can see the effect of our work in our daily life and with our friends, uh, sons, and, and everyone. We have even, and I'm looking at the, this direction, we have unlocked billions of, uh, uh, of euros that were uh, trapped uh, between the sender and the receiver. 200,000 is, uh, is the figure, 200 billion a day. Uh, in, uh, we have uh, made the research in at Pay, and, and, and the amount is, is huge. It's, it's billions uh, of euros a day that uh, we can unlock and, and serve the economy. We can increase the GDP, but, but if that effect is, is, is huge, imagine the, the, um, the speed that we have pushed to the, to the, to the, uh, the velocity of uh, money. If, if, if you, we have D plus one uh, settlement, you can make five transactions a week. You have a D plus zero or the same day, you can make three, four transactions, so maybe 20 a week. With instant payments, you can do 20 in a minute. Imagine the, the speed of money is and uh, looking at the experts at the ECB. And, and, and we, we can see that effect that, that, that our work is doing. We have a purpose. With instant payments, we can even have another purpose. I have a lot of friends in Latin America for obvious reasons. For, for some countries, uh, the worker remittances is 25, even 30% of the GDP. If we can push a little bit, help, make it easier, uh, cheaper, better, we can make a difference on these countries. And I stop here. Thank you so much. So uh, we have a lot of work ahead of us, clearly, but uh, I'm glad to see that we also have a lot of ambition here. <laughs> so um, thank you very much for your insight and your participation. Um, and we've run out of time, so I'll close it here. Thank you very much to our panelists. Yeah, so thank you to the panel. Thank you, Tara, for moderating. And we just have the closing remarks. So, Ulek, maybe you want to move up or you want to, you have to do a bit of closing remarks or you just want to say thank you and choose. <laughs> but uh, otherwise, I have some closing remarks with some mentees. So just go ahead with a little bit of a. Uh... The panel for a moment, I thought, who will give the closing remarks? And I thought, am I supposed to do so? So um, I haven't I haven't prepared anything. And I would say what uh, Jose Luis has been saying at the end was uh, almost good, uh, good closing remarks that, uh, you know, payments is uh, crucial. Retail payments is uh, really, you know, everybody's affected. Everybody uh, sees the effects. I mean, in retail payments, unfortunately, we don't always 
know what we pay for for the payments in Europe. You know whatever you use, you um, you believe uh, you you pay the same. The merchant sees a difference, and the let's say uh, market uh, dynamics towards um, you know bringing up the the cheapest, the best payment solutions are not necessarily working. So it's a field where let's say simple economics doesn't work. You have network effects. You have past dependencies, and that's why also we have uh, conferences and central banks, let's say, look into this as catalyst, not only as operator, but as a catalyst to try to shake the market towards um, finding, you know, a good uh, equilibrium, good solutions in the interest of society. And I think the conference was, uh, was very useful because we touched on many topics which at the end are, are relevant for society as someone was saying in an earlier panel, at the end, the citizen uh, will pay for it, the user will pay for it, and that's uh, why it's a topic of public interest, uh, including the inclusion dimension, of course. So I, I think it was a very interesting conference. I learned a lot. So thank you very much for coming and looking forward for a similar event, maybe in one or two years. Thank you very much. <laughs>